Materium object. Oops. I'm Secretary of Object of the Gloria and Metal Smithing Student Organization, who is responsible for um, supporting Nicole Jacquard's visit today. I wanted to take a moment to tell you about several events that are happening within our area. April 20th is the Kenilworth Open House from 11 to 2. Please stop by the third floor and check out the new Digital Craft Research Lab. Also on view on the third floor of Kenilworth will be the Metal's 13th um, Annual Juried Exhibition. And that is opening April 18th from 6 to 8. And we are happy to have Nicole Jacquard be our guest juror this year. Um, Nicole Jacquard is an associate professor of jewelry, metal smithing, and sculpture at Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana. Her, in her education includes a Bachelor of Arts from IU in 1991 and her first MFA from the University of Michigan. Nicole received her second MFA in 1995 while on a Fulbright scholarship to Australia at RMIT University in Melbourne. And in 2004, Nicole returned to RMIT and completed her PhD in Fine Arts. Her lecture this evening will highlight the connections between innovative technology, traditional tools, and hand skills, and show how the computer has been adapted into her studio practice. Please join me in welcoming Nicole Jacquard. Set up like a gallery. It has um, 
different views in which people see you and how you perceive yourself, and the spine is on the uh, pedestal in the center. It was at this time that I went on to Australia for the first time, and I was able to get another uh, master's degree while I was down there, and I received a Fulbright scholarship. Most people don't know that Australia is pretty much the same size as the United States, and where I was located was right down here in Melbourne. The distance between Melbourne to Sydney, which most people would think that it's a very short distance, is about an 11 hour drive. So I went down to Australia because I was really interested in flora and fauna. I was really interested in the landscape that was there. And this is the Great Ocean Road, it's about three hours outside of Melbourne. This is a uh, Stewart Desert Pea that's out in the middle of, um, in the middle of the desert in the outback. Uh, I'm a scuba diver, so if there's anyone who tells you that you you cannot write a grant to go scuba dive. They are lying to you, because I did it. It was awesome. <laughs> it's me and my sister. And so I was really interested in, in these forms that you find on the Great Barrier Reef, and that's the largest natural reef in the world. These reefs were derived from some of those sea anemones and sea creatures that were under the water. It was while I was in Melbourne that I really became engrossed in the architecture. Um, Australia is a very relatively new country itself, and so they have this really strange mix of architecture, everything from, from what looks like to me something you'd find in New Orleans, to very modern buildings. These are the main buildings that are on the main street in Melbourne. So this is um, what's known as Building 8. This would be everything from coffee houses in there to lecture halls to a library. Right next to it is this historic building called Story Hall, which is now a gallery, and then they've just built this relatively um, recently, within like the past seven or eight years. And so with that, I became really interested in architecture itself. I thought that I was actually going to start to do some more figurative work, but that kind of flew out the window as soon as I got there. And then when I came back, I was really kind of surprised to actually see one of my pieces on Metal Smith Magazine cover. When I came back, I was um, trying to find a job. I was working at the uh, University of Toledo. I was also working at a jewelry store. I was still baking and applying to shows. And these are some of the pieces that I was making while I was back. And it didn't occur to me until one of my professors um, asked me if I wanted to go out to Seattle to learn a computer program, how I would actually put this in my practice. At the time, I was making these um, production lines and these were little compact mirrors and picture frames and I was drawing these out by hand, sending them to the plastic company and then they were putting those into a CAD program and translating them for, for me. And so at that particular point I said, wow, I can actually learn this program and do this a little bit easier rather than you know, going through the drawing process by hand and then erasing and going back and forth. When I went down to Australia, this, these were some of the pieces of jewelry that I was making at that particular time. You can see that they all had several solder joints in one place. They all relied somewhat on geometry to, be so, to look somewhat correct or even. So when I went down there, there was no software program. I brought it myself. There was no equipment there. I actually had to farm everything out. So I was literally learning from scratch how to put this in my practice. And so this was one of the first pieces that I got back, and it was made out of SLS nylon, which is a uh, centered nylon, and then I immediately <laughs> took it, made a mold of it, and then cast it in silver. It was at that point that I was, you know, really kind of excited and then really let down because I lost that beautiful quality of this material that you can't get any other way unless you actually use this process of selective laser sintering. So overall, when I start to talk about computer-aided design, um, or just how I put this in my practice, there is some terminology. And a lot of people get confused with this terminology, especially if you haven't used it. So computer-aided design are basically software programs that let you design on the computer. The one that I use is Rhino. There's many out there. There's Maya. There's FormZ. They all do the same thing. It lets you create something on the computer. Computer-aided machining are basically subtractive methods. And layer by layer, a material is subtracted until you actually have your final product. In contrast, rapid prototyping and machining, those are additive methods. And those are, again, layer by layer, something is built up into a particular form. And then there's reverse engineering. And that's taking an existing object and scanning it and then translating that back into the computer. And the Smithsonian is doing, the Smithsonian is doing a lot of this. They're actually scanning your entire collections. It's not only for preservation, but it's also for research. So this is very widespread. When I went down to Australia to get my PhD, and my PhD is, um, a role for computer-aided design within a contemporary art practice. 
This was the work that was being done. Tyler School of Art had already had CAD in their program for over 15 years. I believe it was more like 20 years. And they were really at the forefront of making work using the program. The problem that I had was that this work looked very computer generated. It didn't look like the hand of the artist was in this work. And that was something that was very much on my mind. So for those of you who haven't seen a software program, this is Rhino and you work in four viewports. Overall, what happens is you have an object, and then right now the object is described by this cube. When you have that cube, it's saved as a file, and it's saved as a generic file, which is a stereolithography file, an STL file. And the way that I compare this is it's, if you have a photograph, you can save it as a JPEG. It's read across all formats. It's a generic file. Once you have that file, it's broken up into this polygon mesh, and that's describing the surface. The more complex surface you have, the more polygon mesh you have. And you want to save it this way because oftentimes there is another computer software that runs whatever particular machine for whatever particular process you're going to produce. So to talk a little bit about some subtractive methods, um, this is Arthur Hash, and these, these are some lathe rings that he made while at IU. So these were made on a computer control lathe. This is uh, Sue Lorraine, and she's from South Australia, and these are some laser jet um, steel brooches that she made. So she has all these parts laser cut. She gets them back and then she assembles them. And additive processes, this is a thermal jet printer. With this particular process, there is a um, support structure. And so this pink wax that's laid down first is the support structure. And then as the piece is built up, you can see there's a green structure. And that's the ring itself that's being produced. So once the ring gets up to, it looks like 212 layers, the wax, the pink wax is dissolved, you have the green wax, and then it is actually cast and polished. I went up to a commercial jewelry company up in Queensland, um, Australia, because they were one of the forefront people, and this is in 2001, uh, who were using this within their manufacturing company, and I was asking him about how traditional wax workers are taking to this new process, and he said they're actually amazing because there are so many things that they cannot do, and this is a perfect example, this ring right here. If you can imagine carving in a traditional method, not only the outside of this ring, but the inside, and it's actually hollow as well, so it's almost like this cell structure. So that's really quite exciting when you find out something like that. Fused deposition modeling, the way that I describe this is a glorified cake decorator. So you have a uh, filament that comes through a nozzle, it's heated up, and it extrudes, and so it gets built layer by layer. <coughs> These are some objects by Cinnamon Lee. The, the piece on the left-hand side, she actually used a lathe to mill that out in Delrin, and you can see that there is holes pierced in the top. It's actually a little palm light, and it has a battery in it, so that when you're twisting it, it engages the battery, and then the light comes out through those holes. She wasn't necessarily satisfied with the fitting of this particular object, so she made it, again, in ABS plastic. She found out that when she engaged the battery and the lights went on, the whole object illuminated. That was really quite nice as well. There are these other materials out here that were not necessarily um, privy to all the different properties that they have or what they can do. Stereolithography is a, a method that is most synonymous with um, CAD CAM, and so that is a photosensitive resin that becomes uh, solid when exposed to ultraviolet light. These are a couple pieces that are made using stereolithography. The piece on the lower right is Doug Gucci, and that's since been electroform, so bringing it back into a traditional practice. And then one of the last um, methods that I can talk about is selective laser sintering. So this is a nylon powder that is fused when the laser hits it. This is self-supporting. And then this is one of my objects made from the selective laser sintering, this little seed form. So overall, there are three ways in which I personally use the computer, as a sketchbook, as a tool, as well as a medium. And when I was talking before, I went down to Australia, and I'm not a computer person. I'm not someone who was really attracted to computers. I you know, didn't play games when I was a kid. I'm not someone who really loves to surf the web. And so this is how I found to put it in my practice. So when I talk about a sketchbook, I'm talking about versions of drawings as well as templates. And this saves me a lot of time and energy, as well as giving me a variety of ideas that would take me a fraction of the time to explore. Templates in particular, materials are so extensive right now, I can really very, very uh, accurately determine how much material I'm going to use for whatever particular project. As a tool, oftentimes I'm stuck in a situation where I don't necessarily have an entire wood shop. I can manufacture these parts, send them off, they come back, and I'm still doing the finishing work. 
And then as a medium, again, I'm really excited by these different materials that you can only get through these processes and what is still to be explored with them. After Australia, I came back to IU, and at that time I found out that we had a 3D color printer. And with this particular printer, it lets you choose from over a million different colors as well as project images onto surfaces. And this is the only piece of equipment that I am aware of right now that will actually allow you to do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a, a, a video and you're going to see this object imported into the 3D color printer. Right now, I've, I've saved that file as an STL file, so it's broken up into that polygon mesh, and I'm importing it. At this point, I could print it just white if I wanted to, but I'm putting it into the edit software. Within the edit software, you separate out surfaces, and you're going to see red lines go around where I'm separating it to the top, the rim, as well as the bottom. There are a couple different ways that you can color your objects, and the first way that I'm going to show you is I'm going to color the entire object green. <coughs> the next way I'm going to show you is I can actually color just one surface. I'm going to pick the top surface. You're going to see a color palette that pops out, and again, you can choose from over a million different colors. That expands into very much like a Photoshop or Illustrator palette. And then now I'm coming in and getting into smaller detail, and that's that polygon mesh that the object would have been broken up into. So to project an image onto a surface, you would find it like, just like any attachment that you would send to someone. There's a JPEG. I pick a surface, and it'll be highlighted in yellow, and then I'll project it onto that surface. If I don't necessarily like where that image is going, then I can reverse and actually move it around. The next thing you're going to see is the object updated into the print software. And now you can see the printer. It runs off of red, blue, and yellow as well as clear. There's a feed side as well as a build platform. And as the gantry arm moves across, it's depositing ink and binder and then a layer of powder. So slowly, layer by layer, these objects are built up. And then after about 20 layers, then they, the color starts to pop out. This is a self-supporting process. And so once you're done, you need to kind of do a little archeological dig to get them out of all the powder. But you become really fast with that. You can see how just, you know, like <laughs> So because they are just in binder, then you need to saturate the surface with the glue. And they made this special super glue. Of course they did, because they want to make a lot of money. But um, they, used, they made this very special super glue. It's uh, um, very liquidy. And it saturates into the surface about two millimeters. And so once that happens, then you can see the colors start to pop out on the surfaces. <coughs> and so this is one of my pieces that's coming out of the printer. And these take me about an hour to get out, because of how fragile they are. And yeah, I could make them more fragile, but then what would be the so I'm coming with little tiny brushes, and then at one point I'm going to come in with the air, and now I'm gluing up the object, and now you can see the color really starting to pop out on the objects. So when I talk about my work, a lot of times it's talking about the process, but there's a whole subject that's underneath my work as well. And so this has been a very inspirational book for me, <coughs> uh, miniature gigantic, gigantic, the souvenir as well as the collection. Those these cups that you can see, these are about 14 inches in diameter. So these are really more like an Alice in Wonderland kind of effect with these tea cups. And so I'm looking at the decoration that's on the cups as well as on the inside of the cups. My work has also been really influenced by uh, my mom and where she grew up. And I can say the UP and everyone in this room would know exactly where that is. <laughs> Most of the time people don't know where that is, so I have to circle it. And then I still have to convince them that it's actually part of Michigan. <laughs> and then I have to tell them she's from this really small peninsula, um, and she grew up going to, going to school with 25 people in her class. We vacation every year down this little peninsula, and I'm related to about 80% of the people on this peninsula. <laughs> it can very much be like deliverance, but this is what it looks like. This is why I go there. And so for me, it's this really magical place to go. I grew up there, um, and that's my aunt's bar. That's kind of what it looks like when you walk out. And then this is my cousin's living room, and that's just <laughs> one wall. <laughs> and then these are some of the objects that I made from that particular series. This is the cottage. It's not like this beautiful, you know, pristine place that I'm going to. It's kind of a shack. 
Um, this, picture, this particular picture, there are these two vases that are in the cottage that I've grown up with. They're not precious by any means. I think my mom got them, or my grandma got them, from like maybe opening up a bank account or something like that. You can find them at an op shop. But for me, they're very precious with meaning. And so this is me looking at the moon, like being woken up by the moon, actually uh, several days in a row all up in the cottage, and then capturing that within those particular objects. This piece was inspired by a friend of mine uh, who came over from Australia, and you know, Queen Anne's lace, that dirty weed that you see all the time. It was amazing to her, and so capturing that within the the base warm. During the middle of the summer, I then went over to Australia, and I thought that I was going to be doing some flower research, but that actually turned into something else, a spoon collection. <laughs> you know, right? yeah, I didn't know. And so I found myself, just like many of you, I'm sure, you're collecting things, putting things in your pockets, through these memories that you have, you know, this kind of other souvenir of this particular trip. And so this is a spoon collection that came out from that particular trip. And then this is a spoon collection shown so that it's on the wall with some nice wallpaper. <laughs> uh, one of the last part of the series is this house series, and these were inspired by these pendants that I made when I was living overseas. Getting mail in the, by the post is absolutely incredible. Um, people actually take the time to write down a message, it goes in the mail, it goes overseas, and it reaches you. So these are made out of aluminum, and they have the images of the cards on them, and then most of the time, except for the one in the white there, uh, the written sentiment is on the inside. And so they get folded up, these little houses, and they're made to be worn. So I wanted to um, actually create larger houses, and these are the cards that were inspired by those particular houses, and you can see on the inside are those written messages. So these, are again, are made on the 3D color printer. They're made in parts, and then they're assembled. One of the last pieces from this particular series is this house. And this is the card that inspired that house. It's actually a birthday card to me from my friend in Australia. And this is the layout. And I really like to show this particular piece because oftentimes when you tell people you work with a computer, they just think, oh, you just click a button and it's done. And yeah, if everyone did that, or if everyone thought that, or if that was the case, then everyone would be pressing that button, you know? Let's, let's make art, yay. Um, so this is the, the the piece is coming back. There's four by eight sheets, and they're in, um, engraved and routed on both sides. And so this entire house structure is put together with uh, biscuit joints and I think two screws. <coughs> and so there's a lot of planning involved. And there's a lot of post-production. There's a ton of post-production. But luckily, if you have friends, you know, <laughs> then you can buy them here and they'll help you paint. <laughs> and then this is the final piece in the exhibition. So since then, I've still been uh, exploring different materials, different processes. I'm really attracted to wallpaper. These are some brooches that came from that last series. Then I started incorporating uh, precious uh, gemstones inside them. So there's emeralds and pearls and diamonds in these that are just shoved into the um, gypsum powder. I'm looking, again, at wallpaper. And so then I became inspired by stitching. And I go back and forth in terms of you know, using hand skills as well as using the computer. For me, there's like not a bridge anymore. See, they feed them too, so they're not just killing them. <laughs> <laughs> and so these are um, these sampler brooches that I made. Again, using that hand stitch work, you know, that was a skill that was passed on from mother to daughter to show how you know skilled you were at becoming the next wife or whoever. <laughs> and so this is the series. And I've also been um, able to go on several different residencies, and that's actually where I got to meet Jim and Yev, which was really quite lovely. We went to Hungary, and I got to experience, experiment with uh, porcelain. I had played with clay since I was in high school. I mean, as far as I knew, you like you had it, and you made it, and then you set it on the table, and it came back fired, and then you maybe put glaze on it. Maybe not. Maybe it just stayed as the ashtray. And so these were some porcelain pieces that I made after coming back from that particular workshop. It was a lot of fun great time to you know, experiment with a different material. So moving back into sculpture, again, um, influenced by my mom's family. They're all fishermen, commercial fishermen, something that's been going by the wayside. So that's actually a, a traditional um, trap net boat. Sorry, gill net boat. And then these are some bobbers that were, I made in Hungary and then put decals on them. Another residency that I did in Vermont, I was uh, stuck in the middle of Vermont, and there was this big wood pile on the back, so I decided to make a triptych. This is a fishing boat, that's a trap net boat, this is a moon that's rising, a 
then this is just a little house form. So again, I really like going back and forth. So this is, a, um, this, this is another series that I started. And I really became interested, you know, those QR codes that you see everywhere, right? Yeah, I, I really became interest, interested in those and how I could actually further expand my message of what I want to say. So when you scan those, it takes you to something else. And so this is what that piece is about. And then with this particular piece, that's my mom on that piece. She's at the beach. And that's the beach that she was at. I found this a really interesting way just to have another kind of connection with the work and what you can actually say about the work without printing out a particular statement. This is about my grandma. She did. She, she ran all over the place. She's notorious for getting tickets. And then this is one of the last uh, pieces of that series. And this was about my mom's brother, sorry, my mom's father. And uh, this is the group. There was five brothers, and four of them were born <coughs> on the same day, one year apart. And my grandmother's and my great great grandma, grandmother's in Ripley's, believe it or not, for that. They were all on the same basketball team up in this little tiny town in the northern um, peninsula. And so they had a woman coach in the 1930s, which is kind of incredible. And then my grandmother and my grandfather, I guess he was a bootlegger, and he ran, um, when there was a prohibition, he was running booze from Canada. They died within 10 days of each other, which is really quite incredible. And so this is some of the last work that I've done just this past fall, and so I'm still using the computer. And I'm doing a lot of layout with the computer. And I'm really looking at um, ducks, duck work, and that communication that happens with duck work. And I started, Again, stitching um, as well as felt. I found this uh, company that manufactured this one inch felt, so I've been taking it to the belt sander and actually carving felt on the belt sander. And so these are some of those forms. So, again, I don't think my work is necessarily just computer driven, but I use a computer in a variety of ways, and that's quite exciting. And so, to talk a little bit um, further about my work with the computer. I actually teach a class at IU and it's called the computer, I'm sorry, 3D computer modeling and creation of fine art. So I teach the software Rhino. And these are the basic projects. For any of you who have taken Rhino, you would know these projects quite well. These are projects that are in the manual and these basically teach you what buttons will perform what function. It also tells you a lot about modeling itself and what task needs to be ha what task needs to happen first in order to get the result you want. And so after six weeks, these are the independent projects that they're making before actually producing something physically. And you can see that the learning curve is quite steep. They're actually making much more complex objects. And so these are the equipment that we have at IU. We have a CNC router, a 3D color printer, a fused deposition modeling, which is that cake decorator thing with ABS, laser cutting, uh, reverse engineering, as well as haptic. And so for those of you who are not familiar with these pieces of equipment, I do have some videos. Um, this is a router, what you're going to see are these tree, trays that are imported, and you're going to see a G-code run, ran, and that figures out where the cutting is actually going to happen. And so a router, if you think about it, it's a, oh, excellent, it's a glorified <laughs> drill bit, where is my power cord? It's a glorified drill bit that cuts on all sides, as well as... It's a drill bit. It's a drill. 
tobit that actually cuts on all sides. It's not only something that will plunge, but it will cut on the sides as well. So first you saw the pocketing that would happen, and then it releases the object from its uh, stuck material. So it would be ABS plastic. For those of you who have not seen ABS plastic, what you're seeing is that seed form being imported, and then you're seeing the support structure being calculated. The really nice thing about these processes is that you can actually calculate exactly how much something is going to cost before students actually have it printed. What happens with this is the print bed comes up. You'll see that right now the support structure is in brown, the seat is in white. Once the object is built, then you take it out of the printer and you basically snap it off that plate. And then it's put in a solution so that the support structure is dissolved. After a matter of hours, depending on how complex your object is, um, support material might need to go back in again, but voila, you have the rapid prototype object. Reverse engineering. This is taking a handheld scanner, and what you're going to see is the information being transported directly into the computer screen on the, on the, uh, in the back. And through successive passes, this information is layered, and then you have the entire object being built. The next thing you're going to see is this object being imported back into Rhino, and you can see the complexity of the polygon mesh when you have a really um, smooth organic form. That's the polygon mesh. So you can see the cube is really quite simple. And then if you have your friend come by, then uh, you can scan their face, which is fun. So this is my friend. <laughs> <laughs> and then I found out that they actually have a 3D color scanner up in Indianapolis, and they're using it in the uh, medical industry. Um, so when it scans, it's actually scanning, and it's scanning pigment as well. So it's getting all the discoloration, and they're using it for um, research and birth defects. And so using the equipment in other ways, we give a, um, an art student, in this case a sculpture student, access to the router. This is what happens. This is Derek. And what he did was he made a pen apparatus that clips onto the router. And so now it's this huge drawing tool. And so we've been able to create um, like wallpaper, you know, just these huge 4 by 8 sheets because that's pretty much the maximized um, space of our bed. And in this case, he's actually taking a drawing and recreating it. So this is a drawing that he made in Rhino, and it was actually a three-dimensional drawing, and then he flattened it. And then at the end, you'll see um, he's going to come in and hand color it, you know, for that hands-on touch. The, the router <laughs> did all the work, and there's no doubt that he actually had the touch in there. And that's there. <laughs> So this is some of the work that's being made um, from my class. And so this is a sculpture student, a BFA sculpture student. All the lettering is done on the CNC router. So to come in and do that by hand, or like to make a jig that would allow you to do those letters by hand would take a very long time. This is an MFA student. Um, these are Barbie legs, and these were cut on the CNC router. They were cut out of foam and then laminated together and then sculpted. And this is uh, probably about seven feet high. It's a very huge piece. This is a ceramic student. The overall goal in my class is that not only do you learn the program, but then you put it back into your discipline. So you're not necessarily making work that's dictated by the computer. You have to have it make sense within your own work. And whether that is by a tool or by a medium, um, it's up to you. So these are some pieces that he made on the CNC router. And this is that foam that you use in, in um, house construction, the pink foam. He then made um, molds of them and did slip casting. And so then this is his... Um, slip casting as it comes out, and then the final product. And this does look very much like his work, so it was really nice to see that translation. This is a BFA printmaking student. You can see that down on the bottom here, there's a little button. There's LED lights that are in this shadow box. These particular drawings are made by him and then put into um, Rhino. Once that light is engaged, then the, um, the illustration actually lights up. And so this was his BFA pieces shown, so you can see the light box, and this was his final piece that he made. And so LED lights are around the perimeter of that particular piece. This was a jewelry metal smithing student. This was using laser cutting, several layers of fabrics. This was an emerald necklace that she made on the 3D color printer. She was able to get that really nice surface by using uh, polyurethane and steel wool and coming in and um, going back and forth between the two. After she made that necklace, she took this very famous necklace of this um, bridal, sorry, pearl necklace, 
and um, she cut out a template in plexiglass. So there was a negative space, and then she actually poured rubber in that space, and so she was able to pull out the rubber once it cured, and she had this really nice, beautiful rubber necklace. From that, she did some engraving into the plexiglass, about maybe um, eight of an inch deep, and she's able to make these lace forms. And so again, she put rubber into those engravings and then pulled those off. This is an MFA student drawing metal smithing. She had this large installation, and so she was able to cut on the CNC router the table, and so it's filled with DV shot. Uh, BFA sculpture student, she was really interested in the animal forms as well as the textures of the, not only the scales, but the fur, one of her objects. A digital art student, she actually creates these objects on the computer, and all these objects are interactive, so whether it's light, sound, or touch. And this is one of Young Sook's pieces. I'm hoping that the video or the audio works. So you can see people talking to her work, which is really kind of funny. They actually thought that it would respond to what she was saying, not just that they were saying something. So they said, come here, come here, over here. <laughs> so that's Young Sun's work. I've also had uh, ergonomic students take my class. So this is Carl, this is his prosthetic leg. Um, Joe, another ergonomic student. This is a artificial knee, so this is made out of gypsum powder and ABS plastic. One of my former sculpture students teamed up with the cognitive science department as well as the robotics department and they created this um, robotic hand using ABS plastic. And then at the end of the year we have a uh, show in the class and this is just after learning one semester. Everyone put it into your discipline, we'll give it a, a general name, let's see what work you make. So this is actually about light. So the entire um, room was dark, it was all lighted by these little tiny, um, their work as well as these lights for their statement. And so this is Kylie and she Jewelry metal smithing, these were gemstones that she created to make this light. Digital art students, so these are images of her videos that are projected onto these eggs and there are light sources on the inside. Kelly Novak, this is a special plastic that when it's illuminated it actually creates this halo around the edges as well as all the engravings. This is a digital art student using um, EL wire, which is a special wire that uh, glows when it actually has a current going through it. And this is a program as well, I don't have a video of this, but it actually grows out of this um, conical form like a little sea anemone, like it's a creature. And then this is Eric's work, and this is a form that he made using selective laser sintering, and then it has that EL wire running through it as well. And right now it's blinking to the um, activity that's going on on his server on his, on his computer. So that's what's causing the light. And then in the summer, in 2011, we actually started incorporating computer technology at the very basic level of foundation classes. And so that you know, beautiful cardboard project that you, I'm sure, have had to do at one point. Students were making their models, and then they're actually putting them into the computer program. So you can see that they still have their traditional models to figure out size and scale. And then this is some of the work that's in the computer for layout. And then taking the cardboard to the CNC router. And these are some of the projects that came out of there. And so it's really nice to see that it's integrated into a foundations classroom because right now I mean, students are really craving for this technology. They're so used to it. You know, they, everyone works with computers now. Um, this was a digital art student teaming up with another student, and so this was the um, interactive piece that they made for their cardboard project. So from this whole experience, I've had people contact me from all over the university, whether it's anthropology, biology, chemistry, um, you name it. They're wanting access to, this, to these pieces of equipment. And I really became interested in STEM education and outreach. So that's science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And what I've really become interested in is more or less STEAM. And that's actually incorporating art within these. And so with that, it's... I've had new collaborations around the university, so the School of Education, School of Informatics and Computer, uh, in particular Human-Computer Interaction, Advanced Visualization Lab, Purdue University, 
um, the city of Bloomington and Ivy Tech, and these are some of the projects that we've been working on. So for the third year in a row, we're running this summer camp for little girls, middle school girls, and in this, they learn um, rhino, and they produce jewelry. And they produce jewelry after knowing the program for about five hours. And so not only are they producing jewelry, they're actually coming up with a jewelry company. They're coming up with a logo, logo. They're coming up with billboards. They're coming up with cost analysis, how much they have to pay their workers, how much their overhead is. And then after all of that, they're presenting this in a PowerPoint form to a banker. And that's actually a banker from Bloomington. <laughs> and here are the girls. They're awesome. They're a lot of fun. And actually, when asking them at the end, you know, so what can we do differently? What would you like to see more? And they all point to the computer and they say, we want to do that. Okay. <laughs> Wouldn't guess that. So a voodoo doll workshop. This is the School of Education and um, Informatics and Computing. So we actually had Katarina Moda come out. And if you want another guest lecturer, she is fantastic. She's a really lovely person. She's a 2010, 12, 2012 TED Fellow. And so when she came out, she had these little dolls. And she had conductive threads and fabric. And then on the back is this little battery. And so you're hooking up the LEDs with the thread and the fabric. On the front, there's conductive fabric, felt, and conductive fabric. The felt is acting as an insulator. So when you stab it in the stomach with the needle, it's actually making the connection in the eyes light up. <laughs> Who wouldn't want to you know, learn STEM education after that, right? <laughs> How about a like guitar workshop? So informatics and um, computing, this is my guitar. This is made on a CNC router, both the body and the neck. And so to customize the neck a little bit more, I came up with these drawings. So this is putting into the computer program so you can see it, laying it out on the, the router to figure out where I'm actually going to cut. Um, once I've done the cut, I actually fill it with Bondo and Pignet. We did all the electronics with the guitar. We made little baby amps. <laughs> There's my guitar. I don't play guitar. <laughs> Yet. <laughs> we had um, one of the computer scientists there had, had a little makeup bot, so we made custom knobs for things. So I don't, I don't know why I didn't think of it, but I really wanted to make a knob that goes to 11, of course. <laughs> and then, you know, fix a destiny, because who doesn't need that with a guitar, right? <laughs> and then last summer I was at Haystack. Um, I was doing a workshop there. And uh, they have a fab lab, which is fantastic. And so I was taking my class up to the fab lab, no experience whatsoever, let's all get a drawing, let's put it into Rhino. They did some laser cutting, and they did it in uh, this really thin wood as well as this vellum. So they did some roller printing, they experimented with it, at least they got to go through the entire process. And this is one of the brooches that actually came out of that uh, particular workshop. There was some other artists there after I gave my lecture, a bunch of people just like ran down to the fab lab. It's like, I want to, you know, do the laser cutter. So this was a, um, a poet who was there, and this poem is actually about rain. You can see it says tick, 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 and it's actually the, the pattern of rain. She wanted to etch it onto a rock. And so she was kind of disappointed with the results when it first came out, but then I said, hey, let's run it underwater. And then once we ran underwater, that you know, the words came up much better. And so she's decided that that's going to be her final installation for that piece is to have it running underwater. There was another ceramic artist there who was from this island off of Maine. And she became really intrigued and she wanted an ear. And so she found an ear online, because there are a lot of files online. She found an ear and they made a mold of it, an uma mold. And she put um, a slip in it and passed them. And so she made these ear you know, Someone with no computer experience whatsoever. It was really fantastic. And then I'm sure most of you, if you don't know, then uh, there are these companies out there that are making it really easy to produce stuff. There's uh, artists who have their stuff online that you can buy. You can actually upload your files. And they make it so easy that it's just one, two, three, click, and it shows up at your door. There is the process right there. There's a little basket that you can order. That's that little fun box that you get back full of stuff. And so, um, most recently I was um, in a show in London and they had this whole uh, band that was, the instruments were produced by rapid prototyping of some kind. So this is a, a 3D printed guitar. I'm also interested in all these other, people send me stuff all the time. So here's this, <laughs> this you know, beak that was made for this um, eagle. Out of rapid prototyping. <laughs> Apparently, there is a shortage on hermit shell crabs, uh, shells. So they're printing them and they're giving them. To them. <laughs> There's actually um, 
I believe that some of these are underway. Um, printing a house. So if you can imagine having this huge gantry that would come across and lay down concrete, and you could actually build a house. This is kind of creepy. There was actually um, a couple people online who were wanting to print guns, and I don't think that they actually realized how dangerous that would be, you know, just in terms of what happens in a gun. The firepower that happens in a gun would not necessarily sustain plastic. But anyway, they were shut down. And this is really kind of creepy, too. So apparently, you can you get your fetus, you know, scanned, and then you can have it. So, <laughs> but technology is changing so quickly. And so here is a machine. Most often times, you're stuck with one particular material in a machine. So if it's ABS plastic, that's all you get. And it's running yellow, so everything is yellow. With this particular machine that's come out, this was MIT um, collaborating with a, um, a musician, and they built a workable flute using this particular machine. And what it does is it actually mix up to 21 different materials, so different types of um, rigidity, and actually rubber gasket, so a workable flute. So it keeps growing and expanding. It's really amazing. John um, Balisteri, he's from Bowling Green. He's actually taken a 3D colored printer and put ceramic powder into it. So now they can actually print ceramic powder. And that's what, exactly what he did. He hand threw this particular cup form and then scanned it and then translated it and printed it out in a 3D colored printer. He actually just came to lecture and it's really been interesting. He's now out in, um, I want to say, North Dakota. I could be wrong on that though, but I'll spread that rumor. It's not me. And he's working with a scientist, and it's one of the experts in the field for um, bones. And what they're doing is they are wanting to print bones or bone replacements in the 3D color printer. And it's because John has such an expertise in ceramics, and he knows how things are going to bind and how they're not going to bind. And the interest in there is that when you have these foreign objects that get imported into your body, oftentimes your body rejects them. If you have a poor structure and it's not ceramic, it's actually they're working on it, so they're not going to divulge exactly what it is. But the idea is that your body would accept this because it isn't more of a natural um, material, as well as it would slowly dissolve within your body. And so your body would actually, in some ways, grow a new part in your own body, which is really quite amazing. And then I was just on the plane, and this was the image that I wanted to get on. They actually have a 3D color printer for sale, I'm sorry, a 3D printer for sale in the Sky Mall. Which is <laughs> <laughs> really funny. So this is one of the last things that I'm going to share with you tonight. Uh, really, again, I really appreciate you taking the time, as well as putting up with my you know, shenanigans of getting here. Um, but for me, having artists use this type of process, whether it's you know, using it as a tool and material, um, for me, it, it's a perfect match. There are so many artists out there who you know, love to tinker, and because they know materials so intimately, I think they actually have an advantage over people who are maybe, maybe just necessarily in the science area, so they don't necessarily know how materials are going to react when given in a, in a certain situation when building. So, with that, thank you very much. Appreciate your time. And I don't know if anyone has any questions, but you can um, read it. And if, even if you think they're dumb, like, what is a computer? I can actually answer that. <laughs> it's a box of magic. That <laughs> now than when I started in 2001. That little seed that you saw, for example, that seed to, to um, have it printed for me in SLS nylon, it's not a precious material, uh, SLS nylon was $120. And so right now that piece would maybe be about, I'm guessing like $25. I mean, it's, it's come down so much and it is because it is so much more mainstream now. And Shapeways is a very um, inexpensive company to use. When I actually price out my students' objects, we only do a markup in terms of replacement for the materials. Um, and they're coming out with very similar costs with, you know, five, five dollars shipping or whatever it is. So it's very inexpensive compared to what it was. Yeah?
In terms of the increase in, in technology, obviously, and also in this uh, kind of maker movement, how have you seen in the last you know, few years in terms of higher education, have you seen um, kind of the interdisciplinary nature of, of uh, uh, working uh, increase? That's a really interesting question. <laughs> um, I see it happen a lot more readily at other schools. For, for me at my school, I'm the one person who's actually kind of pushing this forward. There are other people who are interested in it, but I'm, I'm really pushing it forward. In fact, so much so, I'm trying to get a fab lab and in the city of Bloomington as well as IU. So it's like the shared partnership between the two. Um, the problem is we don't have an engineering school, we don't have an architecture school. So to actually support that is, has become really quite difficult. Um, I have so many other departments who would like to collaborate, and that's fantastic, but it's really kind of overcoming the structure that is in the university right now. Um, I have students who are seeking out this whole other curriculum. They're actually making up their whole other curriculum that they want by seeking out these classes through all these different outlets. And so um, I've been teaming up with uh, School of Education and um, Human Computer Interaction to propose a maker minor. So you're learning not only the, the technical side, you're also learning more of an artistic side, you're also learning the educational side, so how you can take this and maybe have you know, skills for teaching this within you know, K through 12. So I would, I would like to think that people were just jumping all over it, but there is a reluctancy. And I think that, I don't know whether it's because they don't know the software or they just don't think it's applicable, but it's, it's so mainstream. I mean, it's, it's all over the place and you really, you can't get away from it. Yeah. The work that you showed from the uh, digital art students, um, was that in a class, were they in a class with, with sculpture students or was that a class specifically for? It's all the same class. Okay. Yeah, it's all the same. I have everyone, and so I have ergonomic students, I have computer science students, I have sculpture, painting, printmaking, graphic design, I have psychology, I have you name it, anyone who wants to learn about rapid prototyping. And it's all the same class. Yeah. And that's really exciting too, because when we have crits or just sharing ideas, you know, having um, uh, an ergonomic student get a critique from a, an artist, <laughs> it's really great, and they really appreciate it too. You know, it's like they never get that dialogue. You know, they never get, hey, maybe you can just tweak it like this; it might, it might work better, or you know, it certainly would look a little bit nicer, but maybe it would actually fit your needs a little bit more, and vice versa. So it's really nice. Speaking of that, does that uh, critique dialogue now that you have you talked about steam? Uh -huh. Does steam the uh, now that art is encroaching on other fields of science? Does that uh, critique dialogue through the technology open up to other scientific processes? Just through the technology. Um, I'm not. I don't know if I can fully answer that to tell you the truth because I'm you know I'm just like one step into it so far. Um, I just printed out a model. Um, that I, act, I have it here. It's by a computer scientist, and the last model that I printed was of string theory. He wanted to actually have a visual representation of string theory. And so now he printed out this other model. <laughs> it's really funny from the first conversation that I had with him about this abstract string theory, now printed. What I, you know, I'm blowing my mind just even trying to think about what he's talking about. Um, and he has this object, and he's talking about all these artistic decisions that he has to make with it, <laughs> which is really great. And so, you know, he's actually asking me, so what do you think about this? I'm like, well, I mean, I don't really know what it is exactly, but I, I can see where you're coming from in terms of having, you know, thought about this in a particular way. You know, would it sit this way or would it sit that way? And it's really, it's a really nice conversation to have, but like I said, I'm really at the beginning of having that. And you think that has opened up through the technology to a new way where the, you know, like how in art school you talk critique, when others you talk functional, do you think the technology is a window into that? I definitely think it's a bridge for sure, yeah, to let that conversation happen. And I think it's because it's that meeting in the middle, you know, between the two. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the integration of the technology in, at the foundations level? Like how, how um, successful has that been and how, um, how has the rest of your faculty uh, embraced or discouraged that? Um, it, the students think it's fantastic. They're already using photo. As an art student, you cannot get out of art school without knowing Photoshop, Illustrator, maybe some kind of InDesign. It's just, it's not going to happen. For self-promotion, for your, you know, whether it's your images or just your layout, you know, self-publishing is so prevalent right now. So they're all used to it. They know it. And so it's having 
I believe that the, um, I don't want to say the older faculty, but just having faculty in general realize that that using your hands is never going to go away. It always comes back to using your hands. You have that intimate technology or that intimate relationship with the materials and the tool, materials and the tools that you use. And so knowing how much pressure to put on the charcoal and then releasing, there's never going to be anything that replaces that. But there is going to be something that complements it in terms of something else that you might want to do. And the students again are jumping on board with this, and they really can see the translation between the two. So actually, the two are taught in tandem. So first, it will do you know, more traditional practices, okay, now let's take that same concept and let's use Photoshop to actually rearrange this particular picture, you know, and let's talk about composition, let's talk about positive and negative space, let's talk about, you know, anomaly, that whole thing. So the basic principles are still there, you're just augmenting it with another technology. All the time, all the time. Yeah, there's so time. There are so many times where I just get frustrated with what I'm doing. I don't even want to look at a computer. Yeah. And I just, I really, if there are times where I can do it quicker and faster with my hands, I'm all about doing it with my hands. And like I said, traditionally trained, I love materials. I want that interaction with the materials. But then there are times where if I'm making templates and I want it to be exact and I need to know exactly how much material I need to purchase, then I'm straight to the computer and I can manipulate it so much faster and I can get like 10 different versions printed out to cut and use its templates. So I'm, I'm constantly going back and forth. <laughs>